Hello, and welcome to another episode of Future Chat from Unwind Media. I am Rob Attrell, and with me today is my scintillating co-host, Mike Attrell. Every week, we aim to bring you all of the week's greatest science and tech news. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by visiting audible.futurechat.me. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, or tablet. I should also mention that Nick Maddox, our newly crowned heckler-in-chief, is also here today. Nick, what is new in the wonderful world of ultrasonics this week? Um, well, really and truly not much. Oh. Like, I mean, I'm learning a lot about it, but the field hasn't experienced any major, <laughs> you know, shockwaves this week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any major stuff to note? Um, okay. Yes, actually. Okay. Are you familiar with mode conversion? No. Okay. <clears throat> so, mode conversion. Uh, you're familiar with longitudinal and transverse waves. They're compression or transverse waves, I guess? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Compression and shear waves. Yeah, so if you have an incident uh, ray of uh, ultrasonic compressive sound, it will diffract into the material, and you'll get one ray of longitudinal sound or compressive sound, and you will also get shear waves. And so shear waves are like, you know, the up and down waves, but they're going into and through a medium rather than traveling on the surface. And after all the Googling, I have no idea how that conversion actually happens. Okay. What do you think? You, you, you can't have ask a teacher? It's, I did, yeah. and they... They don't really know. They just know that it happens. Yep. That's unfortunate. It's pretty much magic. <laughs> it's it has to do when it, it it reaches the impedance boundary and then it it does some kind of weird deflection that has splits into two components. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it splits into two components because they have different velocities in the medium. Or, yep. yeah. Densities. But. Yeah. but why? How? Actually, no, it's not why, it's how that I'm wondering. Like, because I kind of try and visualize it in my head, and maybe when the compression hits, that causes, like, a down formation, and when a rarefaction hits the surface, it would cause an up thing, or something. I t it's bothering me. <laughs> Nick, I regret asking you this question. <laughs> but I, I think when the wave, start. if I remember correctly, if you have a compression wave that's incident at a normal angle to the boundary, I don't think it splits into the shear wave component. No, it doesn't. No. So, so that's... Because yeah. it, it's partially a result of refraction, and yeah. that won't happen at normal incident. Yeah. Okay. Rob, is this... Do you feel how I feel when you guys start talking about Apple? Maybe. <laughs> I'm actually interested to know how our listeners feel, if because maybe they really like this. Because Mike, you seem to be really into it, but I'm just I'm more confused than anything. I just saw like I just saw <laughs> Rob's hand go up and his face kind of sink into his hand like this. Yeah, it's actually I actually we didn't go into as much depth as far as how it happens. It's just like you said, it's like well, it happens, and this is the formula to figure out what component turns into shear wave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, go sound. <laughs> so <laughs> about, this, about this dress, Nick, I'm going to let you start because the, the, it apparently hasn't worn off yet for you. I might kind of be over it, but we can talk about the... We didn't want to talk about the, the dress itself. We want to talk about sort of the, the science behind it. Was there something you wanted to say specifically on that? Did you guys drop a podcast yesterday? No. no. Did you do a podcast yesterday? No. No. 
Julia had plans. <laughs> oh, we had plans, yeah. So, oh, right. Sorry, I forgot you guys are getting married. That's, it's a weird <laughs> thing. If I hadn't gone, I would have done it. <laughs> uh, I'm, there is a picture of a dress, and I find it baffling and a little bit bewildering, and and yeah. We have to mention it. I, I feel like we, Mike and I, for, for reference, we were going to try to have a podcast, like a, a bonus episode to talk about this last night because we've been arguing. I've been saying that it's it's difficult to be wrong about perception because it's what your perception is. I wasn't trying to argue that even though I saw the dress as white and gold, I wasn't trying to argue that it literally was white and gold. I was just arguing that that's how a lot of people saw it. And I just thought it was interesting that it, I, I don't know what it is about perception, but it does come kind of down to it being a, a fight, one against one side against the other, even though I don't think it has to be an argument. I just think it's a cool, interesting thing, like a scientific phenomenon that is cool to talk about. Well, it is absolutely, like, it does totally fall in under science and tech news because yeah. it is the science of perception and how the eye kind of, or not the eye, but the brain kind of corrects for things. Because, mm -hmm. I mean... In normal conditions, everything's slightly yellow because of the sun's light. And in an eclipse or in the evening, the light is a little more blue, but we still see whites as white. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I absolutely th thought the w the dress was white and gold. And I still see that. Yeah. And I also firmly believe that if it is a blue and dark brown dress then it is I want to use the word abomination so Nick it's blue and black Nick go go google the actual dress it is literally blue and black we're arguing right now we're discussing right now what it looked like it, it's, it, it's, it's not an if anymore it's can you send me a blue link I will send you a link Mike what do you think about this well before before I kind of weigh in, I just want to say that I'm I'm wearing my white hoodie in in honor of the whole occasion. So, uh, just wanted oh, to kind are of. You? I, I don't know. You do, you guys tell me. Um, <laughs> it looks pretty blue. <laughs> well, so, in that case, Mike, I'm wearing my gold hoodie. You are, and Rob is <laughs> wearing his gold shirt. Oh no. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I I can see. There's no white in that picture. There's also no. There's also very limited. There's no to black. black. Yeah, it's I I I would say it's blue and gold. The only reason that I said it was blue and black because the two options were white and gold or blue and black, and it's yeah. a lot closer to blue and black than white and gold. If you look at the lower part of the dress in the picture, you can kind of see black in it, but it's kind of yeah mostly blue and gold. But um. I don't know. I think it's just when I, when people were saying white and gold, I thought they were just trolling. So it definitely looked white and gold, and I was thinking people were crazy. But now I mostly most of the time when I look at it, I see black and blue. But obviously, it's washed out and do you actually white see balance black? wrong, or do you just say that now because you know what's supposed my, to be? My black. brain interprets it as black and blue now, most of the time. But I can still see white. Black and blue. or gold? My brain interprets it as black and blue now. <laughs> I can't be any more clear about that. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. There's, there's no, there's not really any black either. No, there's no, but my brain interprets the the dark sections and says, okay, that's black. It's unlikely that this dress has like a gradient going from because black to gold. Because you told yourself that it's supposed to be black. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Okay. So I'm looking at the dress, which yep. is a phrase I never thought would <laughs> come out of my mouth. And I don't know. The world is a lie. I, I, I know. don't. How do I? This that is like the end of inception for me. <laughs> when like you just your entire concept of reality is called into question. I know. It's crazy. See, in the picture in that BuzzFeed article you just linked to is a lot darker than what was circulating. It looks like. Uh, I used to think that, but now I think that my brain is just completely capable of fluidly going between the two extremes. See, this picture looks very black. 
The bl- the black in it is actually quite black. The other yeah, ones I was looking is, at is is quite gold. But this is an embedded. This is the actual original embedded Tumblr post. Yeah. So that's what I mean. I don't know what pictures have been circulating around, but I know some were a lot darker and some were a lot lighter than than that picture. Yeah. So, in that case, how how does one actually take a picture where it comes out that way? Just like just background lighting. Extraordinarily washed out, or it's washed out, and the white balance is off. Hmm. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's that. So we could probably move on. Okay. Um, the next piece of follow-up we have here is from net neutrality in the states. Uh, so the FCC has voted. To, I mean, the details haven't all come out yet, and it, it wasn't released to the public, but the decision itself was sort of the way of forwarding net neutrality. So the FCC wants to reclassify Internet service providers as, as common carriers, which is the thing that the average person wanted and the thing that corporations that are the service providers themselves didn't want. So I just wanted to sort of do a little cheer and, and uh, hip, hip, hooray for the FCC for doing the right thing. Woo! <laughs> And, I mean, in other news coming out of the States, a certain pipeline got vetoed, as promised. It did. Yeah, that's true. Boo! <laughs> that is not the right decision. And you can read about why on my blog. <laughs> well, it's I not the right decision for Canada. Equations dot, or, no. <laughs> VodkaEquations.blogspot.com Yeah. Um you could argue that for certain people it might be bad, but for certain people it might be good. I don't think you could say it's unequivocally bad for everyone. I I almost think it is. Yeah. There are a lot of opponents of that pipeline. For the wrong reasons. Um, they're they're yeah. saying they're saying that demand's gonna increase because of the pipeline. Demand is demand. It's gonna be there and it has to get there somehow. Uh so it's either by rail rail truck or pipeline. Yeah, or truck that's not designed to carry oil and so it or a train that's not designed to carry oil, so it jumps off the tracks and explodes. No, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's, exactly that's, what, that's the thing. Like that's a point. The, yeah, the oil will move, but there, like, this, it, it's not a question of whether or not oil will be exported. It will move, and if it is not through a pipeline, it is significantly more dangerous than it would be otherwise. Right, but there, there is a sort of argument to be made. People have shown with studies that, for instance, there's if there are more lanes on a certain road, traffic will go to that road to keep it at an equilibrium. Like, there'll be more traffic to larger roads. And so, I don't know, like, there's no scientists to back this up right now, because we obviously don't have this major pipeline, but I think the argument could be made that if there was more oil, that people would use more oil. So there could be a sort of equilibrium effect. No, no, that's not even a thing. It's... Well, if no, but the road if, if, thing, the road thing is social science and human behavior. But yeah, it's like, oh, there's this new road. I'm going to take that instead. But it has nothing to do with the newness of the road. It's the number of lanes in the road. So if if the amount of oil in the states that comes down through this pipeline increases, the cost of oil is going to go down, and people are going to use more oil. Like there's there's a balance there. The, the add, lanes, the lanes thing is more just increasing capacity. That the the pipeline is supposed to replace the rail. Uh, I guess so. I, I, in that sense, sure. Like further, there is not enough oil coming out of Alberta to affect the global price. <clears throat> Sorry, it's like that's not going to happen. If it caused a drop in oil prices, it would be marginal at best. I, I'm, it's okay. just it's cheaper and easier to transport, and you know, safer because I mean. Pipelines do rupture, and they do get oil in places. But hundreds you... of liters, Nick. Hundreds of liters. <laughs> but... <laughs> oh no! Oh no! But I mean, weigh that against you know Lac Mégantique. Yeah. So yeah, hundreds of liters could spill. <laughs> I didn't Which is really know. Really, that... not that much. Like, is that what? <laughs> no, it's, it's not. <laughs> I didn't know that the pipeline was desi- was expected to replace the other methods. I thought it was to supplement, to to provide more overall oil. No, if it's just replacing, then then that's different. Other, 
the other modes of transportation are just because they don't have the pipelines. Yeah, they don't have enough pipeline to carry the product. Okay. I'm gonna have to look more into this because the yeah, I've seen mostly from the states. People are saying it's mostly bad, but I guess uh, yeah. I had Rob. Heard did you that. even read my blog? I didn't. I've read many of your blog posts, but I did not read that one. Why? I I realized yesterday I didn't listen to the most recent East Meets West yet. I saw it in my podcast queue, and I was like, "What? Well, you are no, you have no moral high ground here, Rob." <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying like we've all sort of done something, and so I was chiding all of us. I wasn't yeah. really just well, see, chiding. Nick wasn't updated on the Taylorette. Yeah. Rob, it wasn't updated on your blog, and I wasn't updated on East Meets West. So. Well, Nick also woke up five minutes before we were supposed to start. <laughs> Excuse me, I woke up ten minutes before we were supposed to start. <laughs> Actually, no, I, and even that, I woke up significantly before that, but I opened my eyes and checked my phone ten minutes before we were supposed right. to start. Okay. And here I am. <laughs> so, Mike, you've got another piece of follow-up here. I'm assuming this is you because yes. Nick doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's news this week that uh, <laughs> I guess Google... <laughs> Google's going to be making some uh, some Android Pay announcement uh Shortly, that's going to be. They're going to be launching it in May at Google I/O, um, and it's they're calling it Android Pay. I think to kind of associate with Apple Pay and have people like, oh, that's great. It's it's really not the same as Apple Pay at all, though. Okay. Um, it's just similar in name. It's basically just integrating within the Android API the ability to add to an app a tap and pay function. Okay, so that Apple can, Pay does have that. Yeah, right, but it, it doesn't have the added benefit that Apple Pay does as far as the security and the um, right. baked-inness into the OS. Like, it, it basically allows an app to link to a Google Wallet-type right. service and have a tap-and-pay functionality within a third-party app. Mm-hmm. But I, it doesn't sound like it's baked into the OS the same way Apple Pay is. Okay. It sounds like, well, maybe it could be. Maybe it's just an overhaul of the Google Wallet, Google Checkout thing. Because the Google yeah. Checkout's going away, so maybe there, it's just being replaced by this. Yeah, we'll have to hear more about it. But from what I understand of Apple Pay, you don't need the you don't need to have an app associated with the store that you're going to that accepts Apple Pay. You can just use it wherever, right? Okay. This so Android Pay is different. Android Pay, you'd need to use like the Target app, but with okay, tap so and pay functionality into it. But Google Wallet does the other side. You can tap to pay I with guess. Google Wallet already. It's possible yeah. they could just be preparing to relaunch this under one umbrella. It's possible. I have... Maybe. Yeah. yeah. This is this is all speculation at this point until we hear more about it, but just keep your ears open for Apple or sorry, Android Pay. Right. Come May at yeah. IO. Exciting okay. times. Yeah. It is. So I Mike, I know you're really excited about our first piece of actual news. <laughs> uh, Pebble and Go. Well, <laughs> it's not that exciting, but it's Great. it's, All right. it's no, more. No, no. Stop, pebble time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone's familiar with what Pebble is, and they kind of uh, pioneered the smartwatch movement. Um, and for the and then once the other companies kind of released theirs, and people were like, well, Pebble is just garbage now because it does nothing. Um, but now they've released a product on Kickstarter that integrates a lot more smartwatch functionality that people are used to and looking for um, as far as a color display and interaction with notifications. Um, and I believe... Does it have NFC too? I can't remember. No. It does no. Uh, have voice recognition though. Okay, yeah. So there's a mic aspect to it. Um, so definitely moving in the right direction. It still boasts seven-day battery life. So yeah, that's crazy. a big big selling point for a lot of people. Um so it'll be interesting to see. It's quite ugly, the watch itself. Um, I wouldn't say it's attractive by any stretch. So I probably wouldn't be jumping on board as far as getting on that train wow, until really? they. No, not with the way it looks. It's not. Wow. It's not nice looking at all. I, I'm on board with the functionality that it has, not with the. Um, not with the actual aesthetics wait. of it. Wait, wait, 
Would you do something so radical as to choose function over form, Mike? No. That's my that's my point. I'm choosing form over function in this case. Oh. In <laughs> fairness, I was eating my yeah. breakfast and wasn't paying that close. <laughs> <laughs> so so Rob, what are your thoughts on this? Well even on the Kickstarter aspect of it. The Kickstarter aspect I think is fine. I would rather have I've backed one Kickstarter in my life and it it's been like two years since we heard anything from the creator. Um, so I don't think it's gonna happen. And it was actually <laughs> it was actually the one that uh, would turn an iPod Nano into a Bluetooth watch. So it was the watch band and had the Bluetooth integrated into it. That was my my dream future three years ago or whatever it was before the um, before the iPod Nano moved away from the square uh, form factor. It basically looks a lot like or would have looked a lot like this. The thing that I'm most impressed with about this is that they have, I'm on the page right now, they have 50,000 plus backers already after like four days and they've made like <laughs> they've made like 20 times their funding goal in the first 10% of the campaign. Um, unfortunately, they're out. The, the early bird, 10, the first 10,000 people are sold out. The next level up, 30,000 people are sold out. So if you want to get one, if you want to pre-order one right now, um, oh, maybe not. It, oh, sorry. If you want to pre-order, um, you still can, but it's already delayed. So they're coming out in, the ex expected delivery is May. You can now only get one in June, and already 5,000 people are only going to be able to get one in June, uh, unless you want more than one. So if you get two, they're still going to ship in May because they have those set aside. Hmm. Um, and there's still 27 days left, so anyone ordering it is now, even though it's only it's still February technically right now, um, they're already not going to be able to meet demand until one month after their original, their expected delivery date, which is kind of going to be disappointing for people who weren't sitting there right on the pulse of Pebble. Like the, the I'm assuming a lot of the people that are doing this that are buying this watch because it, it, it is fairly affordable probably have already tried a pebble or they already own a pebble and so people who are new to the brand probably aren't going to know right away what's uh, about this pebble time and so they're not going to get to experience it until the summer or much later just because they're going to be they're already so far behind on demand that they're having to open a new tier that doesn't ship until a month after the open yeah kicks or pebbles had a lot of criticism for turning to Kickstarter for releasing this product um, because they are an established company that has a lot of money. They're, they have a product line already and have sold a lot. So people feel that it's an abuse of the system to use Kickstarter for the advertising and the pre-ordering functionality versus actually funding the production. Um, and there's it's not the only brand that's kind of come under fire for doing that. I know, I think with Zach Braff's movie, uh, yeah. they were saying that he didn't really need Kickstarter for that. Um, so I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on, on that tactic of using crowdfunding uh, forums to be basically doing advertising and pre-ordering. Pre yeah. Yeah. Well, um, my thoughts based on what you've just said are that uh, honestly, I believe Zach Braff like, yeah, he had access to, um, what is it, studio money? But studio money always comes with strings attached, and he wouldn't have total, uh, what do you want? It's creative control. control. Yeah, total creative control over the project. And so I'm absolutely fine with him going to Kickstarter. That's fair. Also, I mean, the Pebble thing, I just, why not do what they did? Yeah. Um, like, so, yeah. Everyone had their chance to get in on the Kickstarter. Like it, It's not as if it was a secret. Right. And if you know Pebble, you know their distribution mechanism. Yeah. They, um, so one of the things... Pebble was one of the first big projects that got funded on Kickstarter, like well over its goal, and actually made it into stores and that kind of thing. Um, 
So Kickstarter actually changed their rules a few years back, saying that you can't use it as a pre-order system, like basically saying no to this specific kind of thing. And then about a year after that, went back on that and said, okay, that's that's fine. You can use it in this way. So they've yeah. explicitly said it's okay to use it as a pre-order system. Yeah. That's only because Indiegogo had yeah. a yeah. no rules method of running things. And then Kickstarter was like, like, oh. I we listen to the same podcast about this. <laughs> You're discuss- You're bringing up a lot of the same points they did in that podcast. I don't know. I just read an article that kind of covered that stuff. Okay. And, yeah. Interesting. Um, so, Mike, bottom line, I mean, I know you're interested in this. Would you buy it? Or do you? are you waiting for something different or not as ugly? Or I like the look of Pebble Steel, mm-hmm. um, but the way that they have their color screen... I I think I'd rather buy the Pebble Steel with the regular e-paper screen, but with the same functionality that this one has. Okay. Because I wouldn't want like the yellowy screen on like the Pebble Steel. I'd want the just the grayscale. Right. E-paper screen, but with the same functionality that this one has. Okay. As far as the notifications and the the mic yeah. aspect. Um. And on that note, we had another announcement this week from another smartwatch company. We did. Um, I don't know if you're okay talking about that right now. No, it's, it is one kind of segue into it. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> um, where is that even? Oh, anyway, LG announced their uh, Urbane, Urban, Urbane watch. Um, we'll go with Urban watch. Um, that's essentially the G-Watch R type form, but kind of toned down a little bit as far as the ruggedness and bulkiness aspect. Um, it's a more steel-accented watch that's kind of more dressy and, and might be a bit more appealing to those who don't want the giant sport watch look. Um, and that one comes with the 3G and... Um, Sorry, LTE connectivity as well as NFC and also the mic. So you can essentially use it to make take phone calls um, or at least data calls and then uh, use tap and pay functionality with it as well if you have a if you have an app that that integrates with with the NFC tap and pay. So I think this one, has an equal amount of, of good functionality that the, the new Pebble one does, but I like the look of this one a lot more than, than the new Pebble. Um, and, I, and I did like the G-Watch R when, they, when it got released, but it was a little bit bulky and, and big for my taste, so this one's a little, little nicer uh, in that respect. So I don't know if you guys had seen the pictures and, and what you guys think of that. Nick, do you have any thoughts? Nope. <laughs> uh, I don't... I don't know. I can't get behind Android Wear in general. It just seems, it seems like it's not fully formed yet. It doesn't, it doesn't know what it is. There's, there's all kinds of technology going into it, and there's, they're trying to add all these features, but it just seems so like. What do you mean? It doesn't know what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't have a specific reason for being. Every watch sort of tries to take a different tack on. The idea of what a smartwatch is. You are you are criticizing the perceived lack of raison d'être in a watch, a watch, a smartwatch. Oh, people, but like you're not buying a could smartwatch you, could you to like tell time. Put on some thick frames when you say that, and maybe like wear some ironic plaid and some skinny jeans. <laughs> <laughs> that was an honest question. Like I'm asking if you could do that when you say it, because it would just fit so much better. L- let me jump in and say that what you're what you're ca- calling a down uh, downside of of Android Wear is basically the benefit that it's supposed to offer. Not being an Apple product that has only one type of watch that can use it, mm-hmm. and that's that's just what you're going to get. You're going to get variety and variability between functionality and 
incarnations of Android Wear. But I, th- I think that's really the benefit, and then you can pick and choose which one you like best. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to say that selection or differentiation is necessarily a bad thing. I just think the, pl- the platform itself of Android Wear isn't compelling enough for me to want to get into it. Even if I had an Android watch, I don't think it would. It just seems really limited in its capabilities and, and in its interface. Compared to what? Compared to a phone. It's not supposed to... Oh, I know. Like, I know it's not. not. Right but, for instance, some of these have uh, LTE. Some of mm-hmm. them have NFC. Like, they all have these technologies built in. But they're not compelling to me as communication devices, and I don't want to wear just a timepiece. This The Samsung Gear S is quite phone-like. That's why it's phone-like as you're going to get. It right. actually doesn't look half bad either. Yeah. Um, it's Samsung, though, unfortunately. <laughs> It suffers from that one fatal flaw. Well, and that one's not Android Wear either. So yeah, it's Tizen, yeah. but uh, that makes it almost worse, I would say, <laughs> in my mind. Almost. I mean, having never used Tizen, I I would be happy to give it a try, but I'm gonna I'm not gonna prejudge it as good. Let's just say that. Okay. Rob, I I love you. I will always love you, but I do not understand you sometimes. <laughs> That's okay. We don't have I just that want to get that out there. there. That's, yeah, that's fine. I'm just glad you're not comparing Android Wear to the Apple Watch because we don't even have that yet. No, and, I know. Yeah. March 9th. <laughs> Hashtag March 9th. <laughs> it's like, I feel like on March 9th, I'll have a watch that can actually like fit in with my life and, and has a real purpose, mm-hmm. you know? Like, yeah. Why do you have, like, point there. Matthew McConaughey's voice? Yeah. <laughs> no reason. Yeah. Uh, are we done on watches now? I, I, uh, I saw this story today, or not today, sorry, earlier this week. Um, Toyota has now apparently given up on its line of electric cars and is <laughs> going to try to develop a, a, a line of fuel cell-powered cars with hydrogen as the fuel. Elon Musk is turning in his grave right now. I don't think he actually is dead. <laughs> I, I think what Elon Musk is doing is uh, uh, it's he's on his way to the bank and he's laughing. <laughs> yeah. He's laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> I, uh, I thought this was particularly interesting because the, the, the line of fuel cell cars is... The word future in Japanese, it's Mirai. I don't know how you pronounce that. M-I-R-I-A is apparently future in Japanese. So I thought it was apt that we at least talk about it. Um, (laughs) I don't know. We've had, we've tried vehicles that had large amounts of hydrogen in them before, and it didn't go very well. (laughs) I know this is different, but I'm still skeptical of it getting large deployment. Really? Um, what do you we think? We went Hindenburg on that argument? <laughs> I, no, but I, it's not really an argument of comparing it to the Hindenburg. It's just saying, like, hydrogen as a fuel isn't... Like, it didn't... The Hindenburg didn't use hydrogen as a fuel. It used it as a anti-gravity device. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm sure that if someone tried to make a boat and filled it with gasoline because gasoline floats on water and then just rode around on a big sack of gasoline... <laughs> that that, too, would eventually go horribly, horribly it, wrong. It would. <laughs> yeah. You make a good point. Thank you. So, Nick, what do you think about the actual fuel cell aspect of this? I think it's a terrible idea. Okay. Because in order to get uh, the commonly quoted figures, anyway, that were out when I worked on fuel cell technology was that you t- you lose a third of the total chemical potential energy of a tank of hydrogen gas by compressing it. Hmm. So that's not like you can't use that ever again. It's just uh, the energy return on energy invested, so like the total energetic life cycle of hydrogen. It takes so much energy to compress 
to be a useful amount that I'm just I'm not sure that's going to go terribly well. Um, and yeah, like maybe if they had I don't know. Do you remember our one TA in second year phys chem with Dave Bryce? I well, TA in a discussion group or in a lab? In a lab. Uh, maybe. He had dark hair, very tall. Yeah, Amir. Yeah. Yeah, I think his name was Amir. He he was working on. Uh, not zeolites exactly, but something ish, sort of, kind of like that, because there are a lot of things that are ish, sort of, kind of like that. Yeah. But it was uh, it was based on boron, I think, and the idea there was that you would have a solid material that can uptake large amounts of hydrogen and then release them on demand. Okay. And I think maybe if you could get something like that, like something so that you don't have to, well, maybe you do have to compress that too, but. Mm -hmm. Something so that you don't have to compress such ridiculous amounts, or you don't have to use such ridiculous amounts of energy to compress the fuel, because you just, right. like, so much of the life cycle energy is wasted on compression, and it's just, I don't think it's sustainable. And, I mean, there is potential in the future that hydrogen will be a sustainable fuel if you don't get it from electrolysis, because that's everyone's dream right now, but again, as Wendy Pell pointed out during our studies, you never, ever use electrolysis for hydrogen unless you need it to be ultra-pure. Right. Because it's just way too expensive. You, you would actually be better trying to get it from just, you know, agricultural waste. Okay. Like gasifying which you can read about on my blog. <laughs> I, I assume you've read that post, right, Rob? Uh, yes. It was I years have. ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it, that was before it started to go downhill. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shots sorry, fired. That, that was a joke. <laughs> oh. That's great, Rob. <laughs> Maybe if I started blogging about bachelorette parties, you would pay attention. I definitely wouldn't. <laughs> oh. I'm picturing uh, the XKCD comic. I don't remember if it was a what if, but I'm, I'm remembering something about a balloon to like floating a car. What if instead of a fuel tank filled with hydrogen, you had a giant hi hydrogen-filled balloon above the car that, would, that you could pull fuel into so it could be held at a much and lower pressure. And then you pressure. have the Hindenburg again. <laughs> but the Hindenburg is like way above you. It's like 100 feet, or maybe not 100, but like 20 feet in the air. So how high are we proposing we float? No, but you float at 20 feet in the air, but you, your car is on the ground. It's just got a balloon full of hydrogen floating above it. See, and then power you... lines aren't a thing. See, Bridges you... aren't a thing. Then you wouldn't need your little spoilers on the back to kind of exactly. like lift you up because you have the hydrogen doing that work. So. <laughs> no spoilers yeah, force the down. force the wheels. Yeah. Down. Oh right, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I was thinking an airfoil <laughs> or the other side flipped over. Yeah, spoiler, we could do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so before we get, we have a story here about wireless technology. But before we get to that, I want to talk about our are technically our main sponsor this week. Since wait, we wait, have... wait. Hold up. Uh -oh. Did we... We didn't finish on Fuel Cell. I want to hear your guys' thoughts. We gave our thoughts. What? Mike, was there thoughts you didn't give? I don't know. I zoned out when you guys started talking about chemistry. But... <laughs> 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 I just... I just... Based on what Elon Musk was saying and what seems to be common sense, I think battery is probably the way to go. So I don't know what... Yeah, to I agree with that. I don't At least in the near term, it's absolutely yeah. all about batteries. Yeah. I think you could have a potential hybrid of electricity and fuel cell, maybe. Uh, but I don't potential. know. Potential. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think electricity as the main power source is going to be the way to go. Until we can extract energy using a gasoline in a fuel cell, because I feel like that would be a lot more efficient and more environmentally friendly than Pardon? using it. 
Like instead of combusting it, you it's just basically just fusion. I don't. <laughs> There's no better way to explain. <laughs> not it. fusion. That's not the word you're looking for. No, but I mean, I mean, uh, like instead of combusting it, <laughs> you would you would pull apart the chemical bonds, but not by combustion. So you use some kind of fuel cell, some kind of catalyst that would convert the um, the, the hydrocarbons. Yeah, the hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide. Like it's reverse photosynthesis. So it would extract the energy in a reasonable way without having these bad combustion byproducts. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like the reverse when we talked about using seawater and turning yeah. that into combustibles. It's kind of the reverse Yeah. Reverse effect, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, because like, hydrogen fuel cells work with a proton exchange membrane. Goodbye, Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's a little polymer, but it allows for the flow of hydrogen ions through. I don't know if you could get something equivalent to that for gasoline. Yeah, I don't know, but I'm, I feel like that would be sort of the next level of, if you wanted to use fossil fuels or any sort of hydrocarbon fuel, I feel like that would be the next thing to do is to extract a lot more energy a lot more efficiently than you can the, from combustion. Is it the much one, more efficient, though? It would yes. be. Really? Do you, we talked about this. I had a thermodynamic <laughs> inequality on the screen at one point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for it. You're extracting the uh, <laughs> the you're extracting the Gibbs free energy from the system rather than the Helmholtz free energy because there's no uh, pressure volume work being done. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> you studied physics. You should know this. I didn't study that kind of physics. I studied... Oh, if you... You, did, you didn't do engine cycles? No. Did you do thermodynamics? In chemistry. Oh. <laughs> what do they even teach you at the University of Calgary? Uh, Rocks. <laughs> well, I mean, we had our steak eating class. That was important. <laughs> that was delicious, probably. I passed that one. Yep. Flying colors. <laughs> they talked to me, Marks, for choosing the pepper sauce, but, you know, I, I really felt I had to go with my gut on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah. now that we're past fuel cells, um, before we get into uh, this wireless news that Mike has, which is pretty cool, um, I wanted to just talk for one minute about uh, the fundraising that we are trying to do at Unwind Media and just introduce you guys to the Patreon campaign we started. So if you go to patreon.com slash unwind media, um, we are trying to raise money just to be able to, for instance, run uh, our web hosting, uh, pay our web hosting bills, pay for, um, we want to get Mike a better mic, uh, things like that. So we have some, some running costs. So if you enjoy the show, please consider um, going and supporting us on Patreon. We have uh, you can donate as little as a dollar a month, uh, and you can cancel the subscription uh, or the your donation at any time, obviously. But there are, there are things for as little as a dollar a month, and we have some perks that you can get. And we're looking for I'm looking for it personally to sort of expanding those as things go. I just wanted to introduce that and actually put it in voice on the podcast because I haven't done that so far. But uh, so this episode is also brought to you by our Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash unwindmedia. You'll notice he didn't say Patreon supporters because there are none. <laughs> Not yet. There are none mostly because I haven't, I haven't used the platform, so I'm looking forward to actually doing that. I'm uh, learning more about how it works. It's basically like saying uh, we have no Facebook likes, but we also never post anything there. So it's I'm looking forward to getting more active to seeing what the platform can do. Cool. That is all. Uh, so, Mike, you have a story here, which I didn't hear anything about. Yeah, I think a few of your stories sort of got under my radar. Um, yeah. so what's this story about wireless? Yeah, so I don't know actually how new this news is, but I came across it this week, so it's news to me. Um, but I guess the Dish Network in the States has partnered with a, uh, a manufacturer of these uh, wireless 
transmitting type system, get, I guess. And it was designed to address the issue of a quickly diminishing wireless spectrum uh, availability. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the with kind of like what the wireless spectrum relates to and kind of the auctions they have as far as reserving it for for networks. Um, but you basically only have a certain band of frequencies that you can transmit on, and once it kind of gets filled, then you have to move to a new band. And there's only a certain bandwidth that can penetrate and transmit over certain distances and through certain things. Um, so this new technology was developed to kind of solve that issue of the of the diminishing spectrum, and it actually, I I kind of skimmed the paper they have on it to try to understand a bit more of how it works, but it's kind of like through some sort of magic, they they establish these unique pockets of signal that gets linked to whatever device wants to connect to it, and then that pocket follows the device that you're connected to the to the network with. It's 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 kind of like a wi- a wireless router takes a signal from this big hub. And when you're connected to these little routers, you jump from router to router, keeping that same signal with you, and that that signal is reserved just for you. Mm-hmm. So it's not like if that if you're around a bunch of other devices connected to the same cell tower, your speed's going to drop or you're going to get cut in and out uh, depending on on the load. Um, it's basically just you jump from router to router that that maintains your signal and your speed. And this is essentially the 5G level of speed that that all the companies are going to be starting to look into. Um, but nothing else is available right now, as far as anything close to being put into production or or into proof of concept use. Uh, so it's really exciting to see that uh, that companies are kind of thinking outside the box and not just trying to scoop up as much spectrum as they can, but they're actually saying, okay, well, once the spectrum runs out, then what are we going to do? And that's what this company is, has kind of started working on. So, um, again, it's it's very technologically in depth and very beyond my understanding of signal processing and that kind of stuff. But it's very it's it's definitely interesting and and will be cool to see where it goes. So I don't know what you guys think about uh, about any of that. I guess. So this isn't this is something other than just like. Interference patterns, yes. I I don't know. It it almost sounds like it it takes interference patterns and kind of establishes some sort of like standing wave. Yeah, because using... if you have like, if you have uh, at least two sources, you can start to set up, you know, local maxima for yeah. signal strength. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that's what it does because based on the what the paper was kind of describing, you need at least two of these little router things and if you have at least two and your signal gets better the more that you have and more coverage but it looks like you need at least two and uh, yeah. and yeah it sounded like they they kind of establish these interference patterns that can target whatever you are and they they even have like spatial recognition aspects so like the, the central hub is has gps on it and when you're connected to these little hubs or the routers, I think it can tell where you are relative to that, and then it can locate you back to the GPS location. So it's kind of like a super accurate GPS, but your device doesn't even need to have GPS on it. That'd be great, because if if you could, like, I don't know how you would do it, just, like, ping yeah. both sources... It would yeah, have all the information it it would yeah. have all the information it needs to set up that standing wave and yeah that is it, so cool yeah and it, it looks like if you're say you're connected to like two or three I guess at least three it can triangulate your position and and you can basically locate indoors like like kind of people are trying to have uh, mapping within malls and and that kind of stuff. And this is kind of a huge step in that direction because I think right now they can get within, I think, like 100 meters or 200 meters of accuracy, say, for, like, emergency services. But if someone has a heart attack in the middle of a mall, they can, like, locate them within feet type thing. So 
Um, just yeah, one of the other added benefits of, of doing that versus relying on GPS indoors. Right, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, the big thing is just the spectrum. The 4G LTE spectrum is is going to run out eventually, and they're saying that it can only maintain another three years of growth before it gets like pretty much running out of space. Um, is that three years of growth? Relative to the past, I think yeah, assuming... like anticipated growth. I think they're even anticipating accelerated growth, as far as demand for even for in speed. places where it's already pretty high. Yeah, well, it's it's more like with people with devices requiring more and more internet connectivity and speeds and bandwidth, it's 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 not necessarily user in like increase, but it's just demand for the bandwidth and the speed. Right. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm yeah. excited for 5G now. Yeah. Now I want my 5G phone. Yeah. Where Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have to we'll keep looking more into 5G and the future of mobile. I I'm still not convinced that at least in cities we won't just get blanket Wi-Fi before we get another generation of network. Yeah. But, well, uh, and. That's kind of ideally what this is kind of set up to be, yeah. is that, that this this new technology, it actually can mimic an LTE or a Wi-Fi signal. So even a Wi-Fi device can connect to these little, like, router-type devices, okay. or an LTE phone can. So, like, you can, you can use it for both. So if these little hubs are set up throughout a city, then, or even along a highway, you just jump from router to router and maintain your connection, um, whether it's Wi-Fi or LTE. And that's I think that's kind of where you where you start seeing it going is just these are blanketing wherever you need connectivity, and you don't have to rely on cell towers anymore. Right. Because um, this these can be put wherever you don't need to dedicate just a cell tower. Right. I'm trying. To, I'm looking at this PDF now. Um, is this they're talking about P cells? Is that Pico yeah. cell? Do you know? No, it's po It's pocket. I think the P stands for like pocket. Okay. I'd have to double check. That's just what they call the little zone that is linked with your phone and or your device. So you, 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 the devices generate a P cell for each user. Okay. Yeah. And we're absolutely certain that it's not pronounced P cell. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think we can be certain of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. The, the, uh, the word Pico does show up twice in this PDF. Yeah, it's not the, the P doesn't. They're, talking, they're talking about current cellular networks. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. More like a Pico network, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, all right. So up next, uh, I just thought I wanted to get your your. We are sort of going to check in with uh, Elon Musk again. Uh, actually, is this? Yeah, I guess this is Elon Musk, uh, or at least this is his idea. So the Hyperloop is apparently going to try to be building a test track, uh, a five-kilometer hyperloop uh, in the next year. So, I don't know. Have you guys looked into the hyperloop at all and what it's supposed to be and, or anything like that, or do you want an explanation? I would love an explanation. Okay, so from what I've gathered, it's similar to sort of a monorail or a high-speed train thing, but you're inside of a tube which is has the pressure turned way down so there's a lot there's no air resistance basically or very little air resistance inside oh. the tube, uh, enabling you to travel a lot faster mm. and uh, so they're saying that in terms of long uh, track um, travel like if you're going for instance the example they use here because they're in Silicon Valley is uh, California to or sorry not California for like uh, Los Angeles to uh, San Francisco, which is sort of like a couple of hour drive or a few hour drive. I don't actually know. It's been so long <laughs> since I was there. I was there in like grade six, but I can't remember. Um, but so it this this technology can theoretically get up to a maximum speed of 800 miles an hour, which is about twice as fast as high speed rail. But for this five mile test track. It's not going to get the the plan isn't to get up to speed because it needs a long way to get to speed. So, for instance, the the drive from 
or their, their travel from San Francisco to LA. But the goal here is to sort of build this test track out in the middle of nowhere and see how station design would work, see how people would get on and off, um, see how, for instance, they're talking about figuring out how the two, uh, like a fork, would be uh, dealt with, like how to determine which side of the fork it would go down. Uh, and the coolest thing about this to me is that there's there apparently there's talks of partnering with uh, an, a company that wants to build a settlement of people, like a test uh, communities around this Hyperloop, just to sort of actually give get people in there to test this stuff. So uh, I think I think it's incredibly cool. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Does this operate on like Maglev? Or no, it's uh, from what I understand, and I, I don't I don't know the science behind it, but it uses it, it's definitely not magnetic levitation. Uh, I to be honest, I haven't looked into the science of it. I I could try to uh, I could try to BS it, but I'm not going to. Yeah. If I'm I'm taking a shot in the dark, but based on the reading I've done on high-speed rail technology, which, again, I have strange interests. Um, it looks like what they're trying to do is have a tube out of which they will pump some of the air pressure mm -hmm. so that even with conventional rail, if you have a tube surrounding it and you take out a bunch of the air, you have so much less air resistance. So much better fuel efficiency and or... Uh, just overall speeds can be achieved. Yeah. And so, man, although if it was maglev within a, a pump-down tube, <laughs> that I think could just run like stink. That would be amazing. So uh, they're saying it'll, it'll be, you're on a cushion of air, so it's not magnetic. Um, I'm not sure how you would have low pressure in a tube, but also have a cushion of air. That's yep, no, nope, I'm wrong. Productive. Or wait, no, it's a, uh, thanks to extremely low air pressure inside those tubes, capsules filled with people zip through them at near supersonic speeds. Yeah. Um, so they're saying it's driven by linear induction motors. And uh, I don't know what that is. Do you guys... I, it sounds similar to Maglev, actually. But... Uh, no, no. Wait, doesn't an induction motor usually like turn into translational energy? Is that not what we're looking for? Yeah, that's what we're gonna say. Or not translation, um, rotational. So they're saying that uh, these are the primary drivers of. It says that they're the primary uh, thing of maglev, actually. Um. They're saying it's also used in some roller coasters, which seems cool. Um, but you can also use a linear motor independently of maglev. Uh, so I'm not sure whether this this one will or the Hyperloop is designed to use maglev or not. Is this, this like? Was... I'm looking at uh, the wiki page on linear induction motors, and. Yeah. Most most of these words are English, and uh, <laughs> I understand some of them too. So what I'm saying here is, uh, it's similar to maglev, but not actually the same technology at all. So it, it works in a similar way. Uh, apparently, it's like a suction turbine that it uses. Mm -hmm. Weird. Uh, so. For people oh, who there's think, like air-bearing skis. Yeah, okay. Uh, hmm. Weird. Uh, <laughs> I like this. I, I wasn't paying attention when it was first discussed. Uh, apparently it was back in 2012, which seems crazy that it was that long ago. But he's quoted as saying it's a cross uh, between a Concorde and a rail gun and an air hockey table. Yeah. Which seems, that seems amazing <laughs> and insane, especially the railgun part. Yeah, it's not. I'm looking at it. Looks kind of like a railgun, but mm. 
instead of instead of you know just a bar or something. It's a train. Yeah. So that seems. I mean, it seems promising, regardless. But uh, we may have to follow up when we to know a little bit more about the technology because I was sort of thinking in the this is really cool sense, but in terms of what actual technology uses, I haven't looked much into it. Ah, okay. Uh, Mike, give a story here about airline internet communication. Mm-hmm. So have you guys used the internet on an airline yet? No. 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 Like, no. So I, I had the opportunity to use it on my last flight from Houston to Calgary. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, was, it was exciting being able to use the internet while flying. But it was painfully slow, <laughs> and you weren't. It literally wouldn't allow you to stream video, um, like no Netflix, no YouTube, just basically browsing social networking. Um, so it was slightly underwhelming, but the novelty still kept me excited at using it. So they've been, they just approved a new method. So. The previous method was they use air-to-ground communication with cell towers, and that's how they established their internet connection. Um, so now they've developed a technology that allows the airlines to communicate with satellites and use that to get their, their internet connection. And it's supposed to be, like, infinitely better, basically. Like, you can get 70 megabits per second uh, download speeds versus basically, like... I can't remember. I, I remember I sent you a screenshot of my speed. It was probably like two megabits per second down or something like that. Yeah. I know it was below five. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's very promising that that you'll kind of get to a point where you can use internet on an airplane just like you would normally, that you don't have to compromise on, on speed. Um, I don't know if you're going to see an increase in, in price because I had to pay, I think, 10 bucks or something for the flight. Yeah, it's crazy uh, expensive. It doesn't yeah, seem worth it like, to me right now. It for for me, I just wanted to try it. Yeah. But I don't think I'd do it on a regular basis necessarily. But if you could get good speeds and actually use like Netflix or whatever, just use internet as you wish, it might be worth uh worth putting money into it if if you find that kind of satisfying enough to make it worth it. Um, would you guys use you know faster internet? on an airplane, even if you had to pay a bit more? Uh, it depends on what I'm up to. Like, in a situation like yours, where I imagine you were traveling for business, I might really want that capability. Also, I probably wouldn't be paying for it myself. But if it were just me, I usually, I usually just... Uh, stock up on podcasts before I leave and oh hey Robs <laughs> oh hey for I like how you're just like nonchalantly rejoining <laughs> for those who are on the audio podcast we can now see two Robs one oh, is moving and oh. talking with us and the other is just looking wistfully into space how's that oh he's gone I just hit him um, Hi, single Rob. That was fun. Uh, my my browser just, but the window actually just said this app is currently unavailable. Like it was just <laughs> white, and I re refreshed it, and it said the same thing, and then suddenly it was available again. That was <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> what were you guys talking about? If we'd pay for fast internet on the plane, even if it costs a bit more than what it does now, it probably depends how much for me. Um, I don't know what you guys say. I feel like it would take it would take quite a substantial decrease in price. Yeah. It. I think for depending on the airline, like I know Air Canada offers a good selection of movies and shows on their flights. At least a good enough selection that would get me through the flight. It may not be my first choice of content, but at least it's distracting enough to pass the time. Mm. Uh, so I, in that case, I probably wouldn't pay for additional internet capability um, but if it was an airline that didn't have any other type of entertainment I might 
depending on how long the flight was, I guess. The last few flights I've been on have basically... Uh, I've just loaded up a few hours of TV or as many hours of TV as I need and podcasts and that kind of thing. And uh, that's been fine. So I, I don't think I would benefit as much from having Wi-Fi. Right. It would obviously be nice because I could like be on Twitter and tweet that I'm on a plane in the skies. But that's I, I don't yeah. see anything beyond that. Unless I was going... If I was going on like a 24-hour flight, it'd be nice to stay connected. Yeah. But... In terms of short flights, it would be sort of just the novelty, or if I, if if a, my company or whatever was paying for it, I, and wanted me to be connected to email and that, yeah. then that'd be fine. But I don't think I would use it because it's just an extra thing that I don't. We don't travel very much, so there's no reason. Anything else to say on that? I I just think you're gonna start seeing connected flights be the standard now. Yeah. I think it's, it's going to be less a option and more of a requirement for, for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so I guess we'll close out the show with um, Health Corner. This is this is what I'm calling our, our small health segment. Uh, I have a few stories here over the course of the week that just jumped out at me, and so I wanted to briefly mention them. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, a collection of studies that were done about aspartame, the sweetener. And uh, so uh, we'll put a link to the to the actual document itself. Um, but they're, what they're saying is they were trying to correlate uh, outcome about aspartame and, and sort of the results pertaining to its health effects and funding sources. And we've talked a lot about this on various past episodes, uh, but I thought it was interesting because I've heard a lot of studies saying that aspartame is okay and that the general health consensus seems to be that aspartame is okay to, to consume, uh, obviously in normal amounts like you'd find in whatever artificially sweetened thing. Um, but this this study correlated all studies done on aspartame with along with the funding source that the, the, stu- the, fund- uh, the study was funded by. And they found that without fail, if the funding source was some corporation that wanted to sell aspartame, the outcome was positive, or there was no bad outcome. And if they were uh, unbiased sources of funding, like a a National Health Institute or or some kind of other um, thing that didn't have ties to something selling aspartame, then they weren't as positive, and they generally found negative uh, results with aspartame. And I just just wanted to get your guys' thoughts and to to sort of see this in in a real way actually play out in real life funding going into like affecting an outcome of a health study you guys have any thoughts on that yes bad ah uh, i usually don't eat a lot of things containing aspartame or sucralose or that kind of thing just cuz um like i don't usually like the flavor. Mm, I hate the flavor. Like, if I'm going to sweeten something, I'm just going to use sugar. And that's partially based on the advice of Alton Brown in his uh, episode Live and Let Diet, which is a really interesting watch, if you're interested. Um, Is it an episode of? Sorry? It's an episode of Good Eats. And his advice, because he lost, like, I don't know, a ton of weight. He's, like, really tiny now compared to the earlier seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, But one thing he said he never ate was anything with artificial sweeteners because, in his mind, uh, a lot of processed foods are too sweet to start with. And if you start cutting that out and not supplementing it with low or zero-calorie sweeteners, you will just you will eventually lose your ability to tolerate things that are so ridiculously sweet. And there's, I mean, no real point in trying to stay acclimated to that level of sweetness. Right. Um, I don't know. Like, health is hard. It's really hard. What? Like, there's more health corner to come. 
I love I love chemistry because you know generally speaking it is so easy to control the system that you're experimenting within mm-hmm. but man the human body is just it's complicated yeah very complicated Mike did you have any thoughts I just think it's unfortunate that you have to even consider who's funding the research when you're looking at a result of a study. Uh, like, you know, you'd like to think that the scientists that are actually carrying out the research are have enough uh, integrity that they wouldn't kind of skew the summary or the conclusion to satisfy the people funding it, but I guess otherwise the research doesn't get done in the first place, which, I don't know, maybe that's just better that it doesn't get done if it's going to be biased, depending on on who funds it. Um, But I'd like to think that if something was bad enough for people that it would just... the the government or the regulating agency would actually do something about it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys... I don't know what you think. Do you... Do you, uh, I always wonder about this because maybe I'm just naive, but like it seems as though if you're publishing information that uh, like an industry likes to see, it just seems logical that they would start paying you. Yeah. Because they'd be like, "Oh, hey, like this guy is saying that we're not Satan. That's fantastic. Let's let's give him some money so he can keep saying such things." I just wonder, like how much of it is people worried about losing their funding and alternatively like how much of it is just mutual interests right also I forgot and I will say that my one glaring uh, omission on things with artificial sweeteners that I like is uh, iced tea it is (laughs) So, so delicious, and apparently it's none of it is real sugar. That's a shame. It is a 10-calorie beverage that is deliciously sweet. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next story I have here is about gluten sensitivity. And so it's another, thi- another issue where there's been so many studies done, uh, and this particular study uh, found that they, they gave people who had self, uh, self-diagnosed self gluten sensitivity that went to see a doctor. They were given a controlled diet with um, placebo, some uh, food containing rice starch. And ha- so half the people were given rice starch, half the people were given gluten. And then after, at the end of the trial, they switched and did, uh, did the, had the opposite thing. And uh, they found that there actually was some... Uh, they, they weren't celiac, but there was actually some... Uh, increased intest- intestinal symptoms, uh, abdominal bloating and pain, uh, even a little bit of depression. So it, it's uh, the, there's a couple things here that are kind of off. Like they're not necessarily good correlations, but um, things like bloating, uh, abdominal bloating, was actually pretty much confirmed as being a real thing in some of these participants. So. I just think that, again, sort of going on the topic of the human body being crazy and really difficult to control for, um, there's a lot we still don't know and can't say for sure. Yeah, I was... I checked this out uh, before we started talking about it. And, yeah, the... What do you call that, the p-value? Uh... Oh, I can't remember. So I thought that was they like R-squared or something. Anyway. The certainty yeah, I, or something, yeah. I think they are, I guess, pushing the the limits of the word significant. They're, yeah. like, yeah, they're yeah. using significant that, in that's the, what it is. the most is academic of set, the most academic of senses. Yeah. Because, like, none of these push 5%. No. And it sounds like maybe some of those people are celiac and just as yet undiagnosed, yeah. although they did say they don't have celiac disease, and I don't know if that's... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like gluten sensitive and celiac are two different... Yeah, they are. Are they ever? <laughs> I know a couple celiacs, and 
Those poor people. Yeah. Like, they... I know at least one guy, like, he'll... He can eat an entire meal, just... He has eaten nothing with wheat in it. Like, he eats the same thing he does most days because there's only so much stuff they can eat. And just... If there is the slightest bit of contamination during the cooking process, he is just not violently ill, but he he's having a rough time yeah. twenty minutes after dinner. Yeah. Uh, so the last story here, um, I have to go pretty soon, but uh, just talking again about another thing that can be causing health problems. So people have found that uh, a, a group of chemicals called emulsifiers, uh, food ingredients like polysorbate, uh, lecithin, and carrageenan, as well as... Lecithin. Um, sorry? Lecithin. Yeah, lecithin. Uh, and, are you and, Italian and, now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, you are, basically. I'm almost half Italian. Soon, uh, July. Yeah. As well as other uh, things like xanthan gum, any other gums you see in uh, your ingredients, to keep th foods from separating... Uh, have been shown to possibly increase or contribute to the rising incidence of obesity and sort of other everything to go with the your gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome that we've been talking about. Uh, so I, again, this is sort of it's not it's not proven, but they're looking for links to all kinds of food ingredients to do with what's going on. Like all these things we're putting into our food that don't directly contribute to its nutritional value. Um, are probably not great to have in food. That's sort of the, the gist I've been getting. It's funny that you mention that because xanthan gum is huge in uh, gluten-free cooking. Hmm. And I also hope it's not true because xanthan gum is a key ingredient in my beloved Sri Racha sauce. <laughs> Maybe that's why everyone feels so... Uh... Like, is it it's in all spices or just sriracha specifically? Well, it's just using sriracha to give it that... I think it's to give it that consistency. Yeah, okay. Because otherwise it's just peppers and water, and you can get some thickness to that, but I imagine it would separate out. Yeah. yeah. I agree. So uh, I think... I was, but you were like, is that why people feel so... And then I was like, alive after no. eating sriracha? Sated? No, I was thinking Wonderful, like... Wonderful, happy... There tends to be a correlation of people eating spicy foods and people experiencing digestive gastrointestinal uh, distress. Yeah, <laughs> complications several hours later. I just no, that's, to... that is something different. Okay, <laughs> I, I've that's never experienced different. that because I don't like spicy food. I wouldn't eat in that large a quantity to have that, but I've heard people Rem experience it. Remember that time when I put a bunch of sriracha on my fries? And you saw my fries and were like, oh, hey, there's ketchup already on them. I don't think that ever happened. I would not have I, done that. I saw you stealing one, and you just, like, straight up stole one. You were not a happy camper, Rob. No. I would More specifically, you weren't happy with me. You were very upset that I let you do such a thing. Yep. I can see that. <laughs> Fond memories. <laughs> so we're going to keep... I'm going to keep particularly an eye on... Uh, these these health corner studies, but that's it for health corner, and that is it for future chat. You guys have anything to add before we go? Uh, Mike has story number seven. It's okay. We have we'll time for story friend. number seven right now, but it's it's also not super pressing, so we'll, we will get to no. it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you for joining us for future chat. As always, we will be back next week with more science and tech talk. In the meantime, if you have a few minutes, please go and tell a friend about future chat. Uh, a real live friend, and you. I, I've been saying something different. So two weeks ago I said Twitter. One week ago I said iTunes. Now I'm saying go and tell a real, a real person about Future Chat if you enjoy this show, uh, and you will be able to find past episodes and more at futurechat.me on the web. See you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>